And um, I was dismissed. <laughs> uh, a few days later was the Gay Pride March, and there were hundreds of thousands of people marching. I'd been getting a lot of death threats, so I had the biggest, meanest dykes I could find all around me. <laughs> and uh, as we're marching down the street, all of a sudden this guy comes off the sidewalk, and I mean, he looked just like the, that kind of guy, you know, with the kind of greasy hair and the weird polyester gray suit. And he came right on the street and said, You're Cleve Jones, you're Cleve Jones. I said, Yes. He said, I was on the grand jury. You went fabulous. <laughs> And, you know, then a few weeks later, the Speaker of the California Assembly called and said, you know, I need to hire somebody, and would you like to have a job as a consultant to the Assembly Health Committee? Now, for you young people, I'm not offering this as career guidance. You know, but in my case, it worked out pretty well, and I got hired as the first openly gay legislative consultant uh, to the California legislature, this despite the fact that I had no education whatsoever. Um, and so it was there, um, I was assigned to the health committee, so my job was to look at all of the legislation going before the health committee and then work with the Democratic members to communicate the wishes of the Democratic leadership on all these bills. I didn't know anything about any of it, so I subscribed to every publication I could think of that dealt with public health issues. And one of them was the catchily titled Morbidity and Mortality Weekly Report out of the Centers for Disease Control in Atlanta. And it was there. Uh, I believe it was June of 1981 that I read those first two paragraphs about the clusters of homosexual men suffering from Kaposi's sarcoma and the cystic pneumonia. And um, I knew immediately this was bad and met shortly after with uh, Dr. Marcus Conant from UCSF and he took me to the clinic where I met the first person I watched die of AIDS. His name was Simon Guzman. And I, I'll never forget it because um, he was in an isolation ward and we had to wear space suits to go in and out. And he was alone on this bed and on the, the table next to him there were photographs of him with his family. He was a beautiful young man before he got sick. I have a thing for Latino men and he, he was beautiful. You know, there's a photo of him with his nieces on the beach with this beautiful, beautiful, smooth, brown skin and these beautiful dark brown eyes and these, this great flashing smile and I looked at the photo and then I looked at this poor boy dying on the bed and that was the beginning, you know, and uh, it's hard to convey, I, I see many of you know what I'm talking about, but for the younger people, it, it, there's just no way to communicate to you what it was like. By 1985, almost everybody I knew was dead or dying. You would see people die on the street. I could walk with you down Castro Street and I could tell you a story about every apartment building on those blocks. This is where Henry died, this is where Bill died, this is where they found George's body six weeks after he passed away because no one bothered to check on him. This is where Alan starved to death because he didn't have the strength to go out and find food and no one was caring for him. This is where Billy was evicted when his landlord found out. It was just a nightmare, and it went on for 10 years. I recently spoke with Gert McMullen, the woman who actually sewed the quilt together. I get all the credit, she did all the work. Um, and she said, you know, we cried every day for 10 years. And when she said that, I thought it was hyperbole, and then I cast my mind back to that time, and we cried every day for 10 years before treatment finally became available. I think for me, it was that experience that sets the, set the stage for this new determination. Especially around the issue of marriage equality, which frankly, you know, I'm old school. Uh, when I joined the gay liberation movement, if you suggested to me that in the year 2009 I would be campaigning for the right to get married and join the army, um, <laughs> I think I would have dated women. <laughs> um, we're, we're, we were about smashing the patriarchy and ending war forever. Um, but I, I think that, that, that this new determination around marriage equality really comes out of that experience. How dare you not acknowledge our relationships? 
How dare you say that we are not family? After what we have endured, after the people we have cared for, after the thousands of people we have watched die, I lost my partner. How dare you? And, uh, you know, whenever I see the, the new young people, I think, you know, one, one of the things that goes to my, through my mind is, thank God you're here. There was a time when I didn't, when we didn't know that you would be there because it was just so overwhelmingly awful. Why would people come to the cities? Why would people join this community? Why would they be part of this movement when it was all about death and dying and, and disease? And so every time I see young people taking up the struggle, you know, it, 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 it's a wonderful thing to me. So we fought, and all of, many of you were part of that, and we fought and we struggled and we have survived it. AIDS is not over, and it breaks my heart that another generation now is facing it, but at least there is treatment. At least the, there is some response. We have a way of dealing with it. And the medications that I take that have kept me alive, you know, if I didn't have health insurance, it cost $2,300 a month. And so one of the things I beg of you is to support the president on health care reform. The health community is not back in terms of We've got to do whatever we can to support President Obama and the push for health care reform. Our community knows what it's like to not have access to health care, to not have access to these medications. So we've got to be there for him on this one. Um,